Welcome to Idagio Live, the place where classical music happens. Tune in every evening for chats, short performances, masterclasses, and more from your favorite classical music artists around the world. Every Sunday evening, Clang from Veen presents a composer. This series is about a musician from the ensemble chatting with a leading world composer about their music and their unique view into music. Tonight, I'm here with Lisa Lim in Australia, and we are going to talk about ecology in music with particular reference to Lisa's work Extinction Events and Dawn Chorus. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Lorelei. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, before we start talking about ecology, um, I'd just like to congratulate you on last week's announcement of the Classical Next 2020 Innovation Award that you won heading um, a program that you're currently head of in Sydney. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, the Classical Next Award uh, was in recognition of the Sydney Conservatorium's Composing Women program, and that's work in gender equity in music composition. Uh, as we know, composition is traditionally, um, still is, a, a male-dominated field. So the work is really about shifting the narrative to expand the story oh, of who gets a voice. Who's represented yes. in music? Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, but, you know, yeah. Uh, um, whose idea? Where did the initiation come from? Yeah. Okay. So this was in 2015. Before I started the con, uh, Professor Matthew Heinsen there, you know, had the idea to start the program. I've been running it since 2017. I suppose what makes it really um, unique is that we get to work with some of the the best um, big organisations in Australia, as well as exceptional artists. And that means, I mean, I'm talking about uh, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra, Sydney Chamber Opera, Sydney Dance Company. So, you know, you're really working at the centre of cultural life to affect change. And, and we are seeing a lot of positive changes. Uh -huh. And how, how many female students can you have in the course and how long can they stay? It's a two-year course for four participants, and we're now in the third iteration. So we've had 12 uh, composers go through it. Oh, fantastic. Um, is there anything like it around the world for just female um, composers? You know, the, there are various programs around the world. I mean, we're really part of a whole global conversation, you know, about gender equality and, and representation of not just women, but, you know, other groups. Um, and I can think of programs like Missy Mazzoli's Lunar Lab and the work that's going on at um, the National Sawdust and other programs in Australia that Cat Hope, for instance, is doing. So, you know, we're part of, a, you know, a, a, a sort of global push in this area. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, how are you working? Oh, clearly, you're probably still working yeah. at this time. Um, in COVID, how are you working with these women composers? We're doing what working on I should say okay we're doing a really exciting project at the moment actually with the Sydney Dance Company who've pivoted to um, make a work which is filmed so dance on film choreographed over zoom you know incredibly and uh, so the four composers are making scores for this this work and so it's it's been really interesting to see how people have adapted to yeah as you say our current situation when I think of Australian music I often think that it's very, well, it's for me, purely associated to nature. Because in a way, we're a younger country. We haven't suffered the perils of war, although the Japanese did invade us in World War II in Darwin. And we don't particularly have a huge amount of political turmoil. Do you think it's fair enough to say that our music really reflects nature? And particularly in reference to the young composers you've got in this program. Right. Um, I just want to, to give another, another sort of perspective on that, to say, 
um, yes, in terms of European cultures, Australia is a is a young country, but it's also one of the most ancient um, civilizations uh, yes, yes, in the world. Yes, that's true. Yeah? <laughs> because it's uh, when you think of um, Aboriginal culture, Indigenous culture. So you know that's one of the the longest surviving civilizations and, and cultures in the world. Um, so I suppose one of the things that Australia in we in Australia are have so much to learn from is in, in terms of those indigenous perspectives of what it is to live with nature, you know, and what it is to synchronize and be in a more harmonious relationship with, with the, you know, the environment. Um, and personally, I'm, I'm incredibly fascinated by those knowledges and wisdoms held in um, the, the many different Aboriginal cultures. And it's, it's a very rich, um, uh, intellectual and artistic resource, obviously, you know, for everyone to, to learn from. Yeah. Um, um, but yes, this gone. <laughs> oh, do you think your students also um, take on these ideas, or do you think that they go on their own path of thought about nature per se? I guess everyone has a really different take. I mean, one of the activities we did last year was to visit a remote community in the Australian desert, Yendamu, um, and um, two of the composers participated in a women's dance music ceremony, you know, women's business uh, cultural camp out in the desert. And so, you know, I think there's, there's enormous interest in making connections, building uh, relationships and collaborations, uh, definitely, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, I was thinking about the first time I played one of your pieces and it was in 1996 and it was the Alchemical Wedding and it was actually in Australia. And I was actually very chuffed because the opening was a ginormous solo contrabassoon part mm -hmm. and you also used the Erhu, the Chinese violin. Do you think yourself that you've developed mm -hmm. your, I'll say, love of nature um, and you've progressed in your composition, your compositional works from that time? Um, sure. I mean, there, there are still some themes. I still love the contrabassoon and now the contraforte. And we're going well, to, we'll to talk show, about that later. yeah, an amazing example from that. And certainly, you know, kind of transcultural collaborations have been such a strong part of what I've done over the years. But, you know, when I think about, you know, this, this word nature, um, I suppose, I substitute that for another word, which is around ecology, ecological thinking, which, you know, really says humans are not separate from nature. You know, we are absolutely part of, part of that. Um, and so, you know, ecology is about whole systems thinking, you know, understanding and seeing that everything is interconnected. And I guess I'm really interested in what that means for thinking about where creativity comes from, right? Um, so if we say everything um, exists in a reciprocal field where, where many things have agency, right? Not just humans, but every living yes. thing and objects as well. You know, that really impacts how I think about what making music is and what making music can do. So for you, does um, the ecology come first or the music, if that makes oh. sense? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting thing to try and describe and try and talk about because... Um, it's very, very interesting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what comes first? I mean, and in a way, for me, it's, it's not really so much one thing comes first. Everything's emergent, right? Everything, you know, I, I, where does music come from? It's not just from me. Okay. It's from performers and instruments and situations and the weird things I encounter that all get filtered into this thing called writing, making music. Um, I mean, as you've identified, I'm, I'm really interested in working with particular instruments and yes. the whole collaborative aspect of working with musicians and their, their instruments, you know, and, and looking for really sort of special, unique aspects of that of that relationship you know what are the fingerprints of the sound that's what really excites me so getting down to nitty-gritty of how you compose mm. do you compose linear or 
sketches or as a puzzle? How do you, as a composer, get down to the nitty gritty of it? How, what's yeah. your form? I shouldn't say formula because that's actually the wrong word. But mm -hmm. how do you do it? Um, well, I often am, am sort of writing, um, you know, drawing, writing ideas, uh, making diagrams. Um, you know, I actually find the iPhone is, is, a, is a kind of essential part of my process these days. You know, that thing where you can just quickly record something, ask a performer to send you something so you can check. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of things that come into that process of writing. But I'm rather analogue. You know, I like pencil okay. and paper. You know, okay. I like that, that sort of real connection that you have with your body to, you know, making a mark and how that kind of speaks to sounds uh-huh and so overall when, when you are working on a piece can you visualize or hear the entire piece or does it just sort of come along and develop yeah as i said what i'm interested in is is something which is more emergent you know where i'm constantly weaving in um all sorts of responses and impulses because it's also that i don't write necessarily um, in separated blocks, you know, yes, they, something might result in a single piece, but it's like I'm in a flow of continuous ideas, you know, musical ideas and sounds and, and different things I want to express, which, is, which are constantly filtering, filtering in. And in a way you can say, oh, yeah, when, when an idea ripens, then it emerges in a piece, you know. Okay. But it's all, it might have been there for a while, yeah. Okay. So I think we should have some examples or a, an, an example from um, Extinction Events and Dawn Chorus and specifically the last movement, which is called Dawn Chorus. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but in the last movement, did you want to have this idea of dawn and underwater and maybe influenced by fish or how did that all come about? Okay, yeah, maybe I just give a little bit more context about this yes, piece. It's a gigantic, sprawling piece of 40 minutes called Extinction Events in Dawn Chorus, which Plunk Forum performed and then recorded, which is so fabulous. And, um, listeners or viewers at home can hear if they click on the link which is provided underneath by Idagio. They can hear the whole work. T t yeah. Today we'll hear, or tonight rather, we'll hear some examples. Okay. Um, and in the piece, there are many sort of um, creatures actually in the piece. There are these fish that you that we'll get to, um, but there's also a transcription of the call of an extinct bird. There are things which you might normally think of as creatures, which is like plastic. You know, what's plastic? You know, if we thought of plastic as a creature, it's a terribly dangerous one and is very yeah. active in the world. It's destroying life. And so actually the theme, the central theme in Extinction Events is around this, this notion of the ac activity of plastic and the circulation of plastic in the oceans. And the piece uh -huh. um, really deals with different kinds of circulation, circulation of time, but also thinking about how traces of time are captured in memories, which might be in found objects like pieces of music. So it references... Uh, a little fragment of Janacek, you know, so there are many, many things, isn't it? It, it? it sort of deals with time passing, nostalgia, you know, found objects, strange creatures, um, which, which reference this idea of extinction events, things passing. But at mm -hmm. the end, the fifth movement, there is this idea of a dawn chorus. And we like to think of a dawn chorus as renewal, as some kind of, you know, uh, but this is not a dawn chorus of birds it's a dawn chorus of fish which is really an incredible thing to think about you know we think of fish as like mute right but they yeah. don't make sound i mean how did you discover but, um, fish how did you just discover what we're going to hear tonight which is a recording of it how did you discover that yeah okay so i'm going to share that particular um um, article actually that I first read about about the fish because fish uh -huh. scientists have discovered that fish are like birds are really active at the changing of the light and scientists um, 
uh, have been recording these underwater environments as a way of um, studying and um, judging the, you know, the relative environmental health of these aquatic environments. So I'm just going to share this. Hopefully it works. Here we are. Can you see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, this is the particular article about um, these recordings of fish on coral reefs in Australia. Yes. And shall I just play this little track where you can hear this very um, extroverted grunting fish and this drone of these, this other aquatic activity. Here it is. Yes, it do. <laughs> Okay, I don't think you can I think of, that. you can't <laughs> think, you can't see fish in the same way, right? After you've heard that. No, not at all. They're, yeah. It's very funky, they're very funky fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so this, this fish dawn chorus in the work is, was my way of, of thinking about uh, a post-human world or a world which, is, which doesn't just centre humans. You know, yes. it's, it's trying to bring out the songs and the voices of these other creatures. Um, and so the next example um, uh, that we have is, is the beginning of this movement, Dawn Chorus, where you hear this drone, um, I adopt a drone that, that comes from that, um, uh, that, that first example of the fish, which is played by wind wands, these circular kind of percussion um, instruments they're sort of like giant rubber bands making yes. a drone and then you hear the musicians and the instruction in the score is a little bit paradoxical but the instruction is to play a melody in unison there's no written melody there's just the instruction right so they yes, have to improvise that very distinctly actually <laughs> yeah? yeah okay and um and so they have to play it with a kazoo a little yes. kind of I have a I've got one here. Oh, my I God, you've got one, yeah. yeah. Why? Okay, so was there a reason you chose kazoo? A kazoo? Oh. Kazoo? Okay, so. because I wanted, I wanted the ensemble to sing, but I didn't want the, the kind of direct sound of the voice. So the kazoo is a way of, of just already transforming the sound. I see. And I think... I see. It, maybe it helped. I don't know. You can tell me. Did it help you as a as a musician to sort of overcome any self consciousness to sort of play it through, sing through this instrument as opposed to singing? I would I probably. Yeah. Well, yes, it did. I mean, it, it certainly um, covers up a lot of things. It's very forgiving. The instrument. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> in a yeah. Little unique way. <laughs> yeah. And so, in this example, what you hear. Um, and, you know, it's a recording, so it's something that was very strong live, right? Because what yeah. you're hearing and what you're seeing is like a group chorusing, trying to get into the same sort of group song, group mind. And there's a, there's a real feeling, oh, I really felt this in the concert, of the atmosphere changing, the temperature changing, because of the, the, the intensity, you know, the kind of attention, or listening yeah. attention that people brought to it. And I loved that. Shall we listen to so, it? Yes, I think we should listen to it. Okay, here's this section. So you hear the drones or the wind wands and then this sort of murmuring chorus and it's the ensemble singing through these kazoos looking to make a unison melody. <laughs>
Yeah. So oh, anyway, it goes great. on for a bit longer. Yeah, it sort of creates a really meditative space, doesn't it? Very much so. And I can still hear the Funky Fish first version myself in there. Um, can I, you? Yeah. I also, yes. I also can remember um, that section quite well. And visually, it was very, it was very impressive, actually, from a visual mm -hmm. perspective. It was wonderful. Um, you've also got another... Um, um, excerpt coming up where you use yeah. the trombone. Would you like to tell us why yeah. trombone? Okay, so this is this is sort of more of the the, the world of the fish, and they're different calls. And I have um, the brass instruments playing these low, rumbling, burping sounds that brass instruments do <laughs> very well. <laughs> Um, and uh, you also hear the, the Waldteufels, these percussion instruments, friction drums that members of the ensemble are playing and that's creating this rattling world that's also part of the, the underwater soundscape. Um, let me just play it, then you can, you know, see what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But in I also the get the, the work. Yeah, go on. Um, I also get the idea of popping plastic, if I can say that. Very yeah. plastic idea as well as the funky fish. Okay. Um, yeah. But then I found it interesting at the very end um, that you wanted uh, this specific frequency. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah. Okay. Very Maybe I'll share the photo first. I think so. Okay. This is a photo of great magnificence, I think. Lorelei with her <laughs> contraste and an extra metre and a half, I suppose, of, of tubing to extend the range of the instrument so that it can play this low F, which is a notional 22 hertz, which is at the threshold of human hearing. So again, it's an, it, you know, the choices are about pointing to, gesturing to this, this, this kind of post-human um, reality or, or world. Um, and so, you know, in the course of the whole movement, there's, there's a whole vocabulary of things, you know, around these low, you know, sounds where you feel the sound as much as, as hearing the sound, right? Um, that, that then kind of really evolves to this final point where you hear the contraforte. I mean, maybe you want to say more about what it was like for you, Lorelei? Oh, well, I, it was certainly a challenge. Uh, because I had to make that extension. I did have a bit of luck that it was um, PVC tubing that fitted into the instrument. Otherwise, I was going to construct it out of um, cut-ups, um, cardboard cylinders. Uh, but then I had the problem of weight distribution, of how mm -hmm. to get it into the instrument. You can see there that I've used a stand in the middle of the extension and it's um, attached to that stand because I needed it to just stay stationary. Um, but the instrument I'm playing on is a contraforte, not a contrabassoon, and um, it, it takes the role of a contrabassoon and was developed in 2008. Um, but I think we should listen to the excerpt because it's really quite powerful, the excerpt mm -hmm. to end the piece. Yeah, and okay. Maybe you should just say, though, about the cellos. It's like a, uh, a well, not a jewel with a cello player. It's, mm -hmm. it's the low rumblings of ending of earth, really, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'd like yeah. to say a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Is this is the last minute that, that we have yeah. as this example. And so the first sounds you hear are, in fact, a cello, detuned. Um, so to really get those low frequencies and then capped off, you know, the lowest sounds you hear are the um, contraforte with this extension. So here's the very last minute of what has been a 40 minute journey.
<laughs> oh, that's great. I'm reliving the moment because I remember how difficult it was, actually. <laughs> it was very hard to um, have enough energy to play that low. You also spoke about in, um, that in your piece, there's extinct bird calls and plastics. Did you use, and, and the concept of plastic, right? I'll just get out of this, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go on. Did you um, use, with your instrumentation, did you use any instruments to portray plastic sounds or the extinct um, bird call? Uh, okay, so so there actually is a piece of plastic that's used as a, basically it's a percussion instrument, oh. right? And, and percussion is an, is an area of instrumentation which has always grabbed whatever it could <laughs> could find to be a sonic, you know, a sonic object. Um, so, you know, in, in the piece it's a percussion instrument but it's also a highly disruptive kind of event because the violinist pulls this piece of plastic through the audience and then onto the stage. Ah, oh, I see. Um, and, yeah, and then it, it actually introduces the bird. The bird appears after the plastic, and the bird is the kawai o o bird. It's a, a Hawaiian bird, um, an extinct bird. It's very, there's a lot of pathos there because the recording is the last male um, bird, the mating call, and there's a silence because you don't hear the female answering call. You know, it's just awful. You know, so this, that's really a kind of moment of extinction that's that's captured in that recording. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So you know, there are lots of there's lots of stories that come into it's it. You know, where, well, yeah, it, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so it's not just it's not just sort of objects and gimmicks, but these things are really um, woven into the whole uh, texture and and musical vocabulary of the piece. Uh-huh. Um, I'd just like to ask before we finish, what would be your dream project? Oh, <laughs> to write for Contraforte. Oh, well, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write this fantastic piece for Contraforte. That's my dream project. Okay, with lots of um, extensions, I'm sure. Well, Lisa, it's been a pleasure. And it's time to leave now. And I just want to say, tune in next Sunday night, at six o'clock Central European time, 2 a.m. Australian time on I Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Thanks again, Lisa, for being the guest tonight. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.